Chris Cyborg is an absolute monster. Once again, she batters and destroys another opponent. Yes, it took her two rounds, but it was still a dominant uh, fight. Definitive ass kicking, start to finish. Her opponent, Lena Landsberg, held in there as long as she could, but eventually succumbed to just the volume of damage that was compiled on her body, on her face. And now, you know, Joe Rogan's calling for 145 pound division, and I 100% understand it. We'd like to see. Uh, Cyborg competing in a division with a title, uh, you know, the title with ranks and people building up the opportunity to fight for. But the question is, who is going to be there? There are fighters at 135 pounds who could probably fight more comfortably at 145. But because the problem is Cyborg is so good, people don't want to be in a 145 pound division. And without Ronda Rousey, like, or just a dominant fighter at 135 pounds forcing them up, it's just not happening. You don't see that scenario where people are tempted to go to 145 there, they, there's no reason not to leave 130 or to leave 135 if they don't have to so if you're going to push the likes of holly Holm and jermaine de Rondami and maybe even amanda nunez the current bantamweight champion who are all bigger 135 pounders if you're going to push them up to 145 for some meaningful uh title fights the ufc better put some big time checks out there to say yeah if you're going to go to 145 and risk this fight we're going to have to pay you some extra cash uh to go and, and take that fight out of your division or out at least out of your comfort zone and it's a possibility, but unless that happens, I, I don't expect to see much more than Cyborg fighting these catchweight fights, or maybe she'll fight somebody of significance, but it'll still, it won't be for a title, it won't be in the rankings, there won't be a division built around her until we see a little more depth uh, show up. Or, obviously, if she were to be beaten or shown to be a little more human, which is certainly a possibility, but as of right now, I don't see anybody stopping her or taking her out or even pushing her to the point where it's like, hey, she looks almost, you know, reasonably beatable. Welcome back to Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions. As always, I am your host, Scott Johnson. On this episode of the show, we're breaking in the upcoming UFC Fight Night 90. Uh, what are we at here? Nine, UFC Fight Night 96. The cavalcade of events that are rolling through, and it's not stopping anytime soon. It's just been ridiculous. And I just, I'm just, i looking forward to that break, but it's not there. And this is a, you know, it's not coming anytime soon. But this is a fantastic card. Uh, we have lost a couple of main card uh, fighters that have kind of dampened down a couple of the matchups. But nonetheless, we have a huge main event featuring John Lineker taking on John Dodson in the Bantamweight division. I'll be giving you that prediction, plus my other three main card predictions on this episode of the show. All of my preliminary picks will be available at kamikazeoverdrive.net. This event going down October 1st uh, from uh, Portland, Oregon. And uh, for the rest, for uh, my bet packs, they will be available. Uh, I, I, I'm a, I, my props were pretty decent last week. My my DraftKings lineups were okay. My 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 parlays aren't aren't cashing, unfortunately. They're just not. They're coming up short. I didn't go, do very well in the last show. I went six and seven. There were a lot of prelim upsets that just didn't hit. Unfortunately, I made a couple mistakes predicting. I anticipated a couple things that didn't happen, and it cost me. We're we're bound to have that's the first time I've been under five hundred in what six or seven shows, five or six at the least. So you know it's going to happen. Unfortunately, the parlays haven't been kicking at the rate they should be kicking in the cash. But I'm, I'm looking to turn it around. I'm putting the work in. It's, it's going to happen. And I, I can't guarantee anything, but we'll uh, see how things go in the next little bit. Uh, anything else worth mentioning before we get into the predictions? I think that is it for now. Let's Yeah, let's get to that first main card prediction. The first fight on the main card takes place in the UFC's flyweight division as the ninth-ranked Lewis, the last samurai, Smoka, 11 wins and one loss, takes on the debuting Brandon the Assassin, Moreno, with a current record of 11 wins and three uh, defeats. Now, this fight was originally scheduled to take place between Smolka and Sergio Pettis, which had the makings of a fantastic flyweight bout. Unfortunately, Pettis pulled out on September 22nd, and Moreno has stepped in with a week to prepare for the biggest fight of his life. Now, Smolka comes into this having won four consecutive bouts. He is 5-1 in the UFC with his only defeat coming against Chris Carriasso in a split decision loss. He has three finishes overall. And this is a very risky fight now without Sergio Pettis because if he loses this matchup, he will have lost all the momentum that he has built at this point in his career. Now, for Moreno, he has an eight-fight winning streak coming into this matchup. He began his career 3-3. Three and three. He's a training partner of Henry Cejudo, which is worth keeping in mind. Uh, he, he was actually a competitor on the current season of the Ultimate Fighter uh, champions, whatever the heck it's called. He was ranked 16, so he's the lowest ranked fighter, but he fought the number one seed and put up an impressive fight. He gave him a run for his money, ultimately lost that matchup, but he certainly made enough of a name for himself that the UFC felt they can put him into this matchup. Physically, Smoke is two, inch tall, two inches taller. Moreno is two years younger. Outside of that, I can't find any more details, but I'm assuming Smoke could have a two to three inch reach advantage as well. 
Uh, now for Lewis, he's a brown belt in judo. He also comes from a karate background. He has four wins by knockout, five submission wins, and he's two and one on the scorecards. Moreno, just a single knockout win, eight submission victories. He is two and three on the scorecards. Uh, World Fighting Alliance, uh, or sorry, World Fighting Federation champion, which is pretty cool. This is, this is that's the title heat belt he held on to heading into the uh, tournament. Uh, he had, you know, I said he had a good fight in the Ultimate Fighter. He cracked his opponent with a couple of solid right hands. He threw a couple jumping knees in there, landed some big shots to, the, you know, overall to bloodied him up a little bit. Had a lot more success than people expected him to. Round two kicked off. His uh, opponent fought, shot for a takedown. Moreno did a good job of sprawling out of the takedown, but he didn't, you know, watch that chain wrestling. His opponent was able to jump on his back, eventually sink in the rear naked choke, and the fight was over from there. He was he tapped out. When you look at his overall record before coming to the Ultimate Fighter, the level of competition not overwhelming. He his last opponent was 0-1, uh, and his two prior opponents had a combined record of 16 and 12. So not terrible, but not certainly not that fantastic. When I looked for footage of him online, the last most recent fight I saw of him was kind of a little bit of a question mark, as he actually fought an opponent who had a solid record 8 and 6, but only had one leg. And they and they fought on their knees. Their one leg was amputated from the knee or was missing from the knee down. So that really you know. All the power to those individuals who, you know, handicapped individuals who are partaking in sports like that. But at the same time, it brings into my que- to question, you know, just how good he is if he's taking fights uh, like that. And in that matchup, he spent a lot of time on his back, fending off submissions and getting pounded on. He got worked until he eventually was able to, you know, you know, had his, he had some pretty tough moments in that matchup, especially on the ground. Now for Smolka, he is a fantastic grappler. Uh, he's the type of guy he will chain his submission attempts, multiple submission threats. Uh, when he is fighting, uh, you know, six takedowns versus Neil Siri, three versus uh, Ben Nguyen in his last fight. So he has some solid wrestling. Defensively, he can be put on the mat. He had gave up nine takedowns against Alpo Skilich in his debut, but he used those takedowns to counter into superior positions. Similar against Patty O'Houlihan. Houlihan, or uh, sorry, Patty Houlihan. Uh, Houlihan had four takedowns, but again, he started started to struggle with the grappling of Smoka once they hit the mat, and Smoka would get the better position eventually submitted him. Uh, Lewis is an excellent scrambler. He is dangerous in transition where he will go for submissions. He has the long, long uh, arms, which makes which allows him to set up submission opportunities that a lot of other fighters cannot pick up. He also chains his ground and pound in so effectively he really breaks down his opponent between submission attempts and beats him up. Again, those long arms, he will go for chokes, and he, a lot of like the ninja choke, that front headlock, power guillotine, darts choke, he loves all those you know type chokes moves that he can put on guys when they're unable when they you know when they don't see it coming now he did make some positional mistakes against Nguyen. Nguyen was able to take his back couldn't hold a position a lot of times we'll see Smoka give up position for submission but again it's almost as if he's baiting his opponent yes please go for this move because I'm going to counter and I'm going to get the better view this way and it really hasn't caught up to him in any of these scenarios uh biggest thing with Smoka is he carries an exceptional pace and he forces his opponent to constantly work both offensively and defensively to do anything. He wears them out. He averages 4.92 strikes landed per minute. Now, he can be hit. Siri had some success standing, landing some big shots. Actually stumbled Smoker early in that matchup and before he got dragged into grappling exchanges and lost the fight. Smoker's only USC loss came against a fighter who was able to minimize the grappling exchanges and keep the fight standing. Lewis tends to be a bit of a slow starter. Nguyen rushed him early, but Lewis dealt with the pressure exceptionally well, scrambled to a better position, scored some takedowns, got him to side control, and went to work on the mat. Moreno, he has to come out and hurt him, find a way to back him up, but I think Smoke is just simply too overwhelming once he gets the fight going. Once he gets the fight on the mat, he's just too good there. Eventually, he gets the fight to the ground. He'll break him down that ground and pound, look for a submission. He could finish it either way, but my prediction is Lewis Smoka to defeat uh, Brandon Moreno by submission. The second fight on the main card uh, takes place in the UFC's lightweight division. It has also been impacted by the injury bug as Joshua, the people's warrior. Berkman, 29 wins, 13 losses, and a single no contest takes on the debuting Zach Zach Otto with a current record of 13 wins and 3 losses. Uh, I believe it's Zach the Barbarian Otto. I'm not 100% sure, but I believe that is correct. Uh, Otto's replacing Bobby Green in approximately 3 weeks' notice. He was preparing for a fight scheduled to take place on October 7th, which... And uh, this matchup will be his fourth fight of 2016, so he was getting ready for a matchup, and he's been relatively active this year. For Berkman, he is making his third appearance as a UFC lightweight. So far, he is 1-1. One one. Since returning to the UFC, he is 1-3 with a no contest, the loss to Hector Lombard. So this very well could be his last leg, considering he's taking on a debuting opponent. If he loses this matchup, I can't not see the UFC letting him go in a very deep division like lightweight. For Otto, he is, uh, he's got some solid experience. King of Cage, Legacy, RFA... 
His last loss came against Jake, Jacob Volkman back in 2015. He is 7-1 and one over his last eight matchups. He has 10 submission wins, two knockouts, and one decision. He has lost each by submission, knockout, and decision. He is coming off his first decision victory. Not a ton of long fight experience. He has In the last couple of matchups, he's gone deeper, but he has a lot of quick finishes and fights where he's been finished quickly as well. Now, Berkman, he's a well-traveled veteran, 42 pro fights. He's 36 years old, so he's certainly getting up there. He's got a lot of wear and tear on those MMA tires. He actually has more fights ending via submission, both wins and losses, than Otto has in total. Uh, Berkman, though, 7-1 in fights ended by knockout, which is worth noting. He certainly has that uh, big chin. 10-7, and seven, though, in fights ending by submission, which is also worth noting considering his uh, opponent's submission record. He has eight first-round victories. Now, Otto comes from a grappling background. He, in his last matchup, I saw him give up an early takedown, but he, he executed, used the butterfly hooks, got his feet up on his opponent's hips, shoved them off, was able to elevate. He was rotating his hips back and forth, attacked with a triangle off his back, eventually scrambled to a better position, or scrambled up, and then went to work in the clinch, landing some pretty decent knees and showed a solid level change. He also, later in that fight, picked up a very nice reactive double leg takedown, and that's, you know, as I said, he's a decent scrambler overall, but that's where his bread and butter is. It's on the mat. He has a smothering top game. He keeps his head, his his uh, arm hooked under his opponent's head to control position and kind of you know make it very uncomfortable for them and allow them maybe he can dictate where their head goes. Easier to land strikes. Look for him to strike and then jump on submission opportunities and kind of go back and forth between the two techniques. He has a pretty heavy mount. He'll land some good elbows. He busts his last opponent up from top position and he has lots of submission variety on his record. Now, again, in that in one of his most recent fights, he did make some positional mistakes on the mat that cost him uh, back position for a bit, but again, he was getting the better of the exchanges. When he's on the feet, he'll throw a lot of strikes from the right side. Right hooks, straight right sets, the majority of his offense comes from the right side, but most of his striking is set up to... Uh, you know, look for him to shoot. Now, I did see one of his other recent defeats. He was dropped with a short punch in the inside, inside and ground and pound until he was stopped. So it really questions a bit of his chin, which is certainly something to worry about. Uh, for Berkman, he is a patient fighter, almost to a fault at times. He will let go and he will partake in these violent barrages, but then it's followed by prolonged periods of inactivity. He opens up a lot with body kicks. He will, you know, go to the body, he'll go to the oblique, sorry, a lot of kicks, sorry, and then go to the body, oblique kicks. He'll throw a decent right hand. He's a sneaky left hook that he lets go when he's under fire and can really do some damage with it when he's exchanging. You know, when he fought KJ Noons in his lightweight debut, he benefited tremendously from the fact that Noons didn't throw a heck of a lot. And that's what allowed Berkman to get going and eventually get the, you know, pick up the decision victory over a relatively inactive opponent. When he fought Cote, he held his own at times. He cracked Cote a couple times, but he got hurt with the right hand and eventually put down. Uh, he's had mixed results overall with his takedown game, which is probably going to be one of the keys in this fight. He does have good submissions. He, you know, we see he'll lock up that guillotine. We saw him put John Fitch to sleep with it. He'll lock up that guillotine if his opponent shoots in. He landed a couple of takedowns versus Noons, a couple of trip takedowns versus Patrick Cote. Overall, actually, over his last uh, three fights, he has landed seven completions. He had success putting Paul Felder on the mat as well. He has a 73% takedown defense. Cote tried to take him down four times, was unsuccessful all four times. Uh, Dong Young Kim was a judo practitioner, eight attempts, just one completion, and Hector Lombard did put him down two uh, two times on three tries. What we were seeing is guys, very talented, capable fighters, looking to put him on the mat, and a lot of guys have been shut down. If you look at those three fighters right there, we're looking at one for 12, we're looking at three for 15, which is a pretty solid defensive takedown uh defensive takedown numbers now as i said Otto is almost 100 percent reliant on the ground game when he is forced to fight without takedowns he struggles tremendously he can get too aggressive at times and that can get him hurt in the exchanges he does tend to slow down at least he's breathing heavy after maybe the first round and i don't think taking this fight on short notice and making his ufc debut is going to help him even though even if he is training berkman's cautious cautious style I think it could hurt him, but it also should help him to shut down the takedown opportunities because he's not going to open up to the point where his opponent can sneak those opportunities in. Again, watch for that guillotine if uh, Otto shoots in, if Berkman gets taken down. But again, that's not something Berkman wants to be te- you know, tempting too much. I think Berkman keeps this fight standing. He lands some decent strikes. He hurts them in close, over- overwhelms them, and my prediction is Josh Berkman to defeat uh, Zach Otto by knockout. In the co-main event of the evening, we are in the UFC's lightweight division as the 11th ranked ill Will Brooks. 18 wins and one loss, the former Bellator lightweight champion, takes on Alex Cowboy Oliveira. 14 wins, three losses, one draw, and one no contest for the Brazilian. Brooks is coming off a debut in his win. It was a scrappy fight. Some criticize his performance, but Ross Pearson is no easy out 
uh, for anyone. So and and Brooks getting the W, you know, it's it's a it's a high pressure situation. So certainly he shouldn't be criticized nearly as much as people gave him. Uh, gave him for that fight. For Oliver, he's coming up a win over James Mutasri, it followed by a pretty vicious uh, submission loss to Donald Cerrone. He is returning to lightweight. Overall, in the UFC, he's 4-2. and two. He's only fought twice at lightweight. He's got a 1-1 one -on -one record, including a loss to Gilbert Burns, which he took on short notice. A fight he was actually winning pillar to post until he gets submitted at the very end. Uh, physically, Cowboy is 1-inch tall, a 4-inch reach advantage, and he's the younger man by 2 years. Now, Brooks, he comes from a wrestling background. He's got 6 wins by knockout, 4 submission victories, and 9 decisions. His only loss by KO came 3 years ago against Sadawad under the Bellator banner. For Oliveira, BJ Blue Belt, 9 knockouts, two in, uh, 3 and 2 in fights ended by submission, 3 and 1 on the scorecards. He comes from a kickboxing background, but sometimes you wouldn't know that based on the way he uh, you know, employs his offense. Now, for Brooks, he moves well. He's pretty quick, slides out of range nicely, doesn't work at a torrid pace. And that's sometimes we've seen opponents uh, exploit that by being aggressive. He had some trouble with the early aggression of uh, Jansen in the US, in Bellator, who pushed the pace and opened up. Ross, Ross Pearson had a lot of success uh, when he started to let his hands go in round three and really back Brooks up. Now, he could have been... Um, Brooks could have been dealing with a little bit of that octagon jitters and a bit of a cardio issue that allowed Pearson to push the pace, but Pearson had his most success when he came forward and attacked. What uh, what uh, Ill Will does effectively, he throws a nice left jab, he'll throw a straight right as well. Hands are still a work in progress. I would say his kicking techniques are much better, much more refined, much more effective. He throws a nice hard inside leg kick, he'll also throw a hard kick to the body as well. His stepping knee also throws some nice knee strikes. He's got a nice stepping knee, or very quick in the clinch, he'll slam it into his opponent's body. If he has the opportunity, look for him to pull his opponent's head down and then crack a knee shot to their forehead as well or to their chin. Uh, when he fought, as the fight in the mid part of that fight, he was having some success moving Pearson around in the clinch, but he spent a lot of time there. And, and for a guy who's supposed to be a wrestler and should have been able to really get the better of that situation, I thought Pearson was, you know, having some success. You know, controlling Brooks in that position, but again, it was back and forth. Brooks will rely on his wrestling, score some takedowns when needed. He has had issues with lack of activity from top position. He did land a good double at double against Pearson and, and, and held top position for a bit, but again, it wasn't a dominant wrestling performance by any stretch of the imagination. Now, looking at Oliveira, like I said before, he comes from a kickboxing background, but he has used a grappling heavy approach in the UFC. He used takedowns against KJ Nunes and against. Uh, Merritt, his name is his first name escaping me for the moment, uh, had a lot of success eventually sinking the submission against Nunes, the rear naked choke for the finish. Couldn't finish Merritt, but he had lots of opportunities. He made some positional stakes, mistakes in that fight, but he still he was fairly dominant. He doesn't have the greatest wrestling te technique. You know, his hips are a little bit high when he shoots. He has trouble with his level changes, but he's he's very effective and or he's very sorry aggressive, and that probably makes up for his lack of technical. Uh, refinement. He tends to make, I said, tends to make some positional mistakes on the mat, which can cost him in fights. Uh, Piotr Hallman had some success putting him on his back, and he didn't do a heck of a lot off his back. The ref actually had to stand him up in that fight. We all know how that finished, but still, it was kind of concerning there. Uh, he does his best offensive attack from the clinch. He uses heavy shoulder pressure, does a very good job of cramming his head, getting low, and cramming his head into his opponent's head and really forcing them to work from a position they're not comfortable with. And from there, he can land short shots or he'll attack uh, with some level changes for takedowns. Now, he struggled early to take Muntasri down, but he was still controlling the position, still outworking him, still wearing him down. It was very effective despite the fact he couldn't get the takedowns. He was pushing him into the cage. He will reach down for those takedown levels, eventually clinch up his hands, and eventually put him down. Once he got Muntasri in the mat, he had some good top position control. At range, Oliver throws a left jab. He'll mix in some uppercuts. A lot of wide-ranging barrages of strikes. He's very aggressive. He stopped Holman with a very big right hand. He tends to overextend at times, but he's very aggressive, and, and he can be very effective because of his reach, because of his aggression, because of how willing he is to sit down and trade. You know, Oliveira in this fight, I was originally on Will Brooks like most people are, understandably, but I've made a change. Oliveira has the ability to push Brooks early, outwork him, get his back against the cage, and put him in some positions he's not comfortable with. Brooks has had issues with clinch-based fighting and pressure. He can be outworked because he doesn't have that overwhelming pace. Brooks is going to look to counter with takedowns, and if he counters with takedowns successfully, he's going to win this fight. But if he allows Oliveira to push him into the cage, control the position there, that's a bad spot for him to be in and as he slows down if Oliver can maintain his pace he's going to outwork him I don't trust that Brooks is going to go wrestling 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 I think he's going to try and keep it standing like he did against Pearson I think we're going to see too much positional control for uh, Oliveira in this fight which is going to surprise some people and my prediction is Alex Oliveira 
to defeat Will Brooks largely on the basis of simple of, of aggression and greater output. Oliveira takes the fight by decision, possibly a split. But I've got Alex Oliveira defeating Will Brooks by decision. And finally, in the main event of the evening, we're in the UFC's Bantamweight division as the number three ranked John, hands of stone, Lineker, 28 wins and 7 losses, takes on the magician John Dodson with a current record of 19 wins and 7 losses. I believe Dodson is ranked ninth in the division right now. It's not showing up on UFC.com, but I believe last time I checked, that's where he is situated. Maybe 10th, but certainly in the top 10. Now, both guys left recently left the flyweight division for vastly different reasons. Dodson did it after going 0-2 versus Demetrius Johnson, attempting to win the title, and realized probably his imminent future in this division is not there to be had, so it's time to move up. For Lineker, he has missed weight four times. So he not only was he, he was he was certainly in contention for a title shot, but he couldn't get under 126 pounds, I guess. And four times he missed weight, so it was time to go up to band weight, where he's made himself a nice little home. He has won five in a row coming into this matchup, including three at 135 pounds, including a crushing KO of Michael Mayday McDonald, which I predicted. Dodson, he's coming off his return to Bantamweight, where he TKO'd Manny Gamburian in just 37 seconds. He also, the last time he fought at 135 pounds, he took out the former champion, TJ Dillashaw, by first-round knockout. That came in the tough funnels. That was an upset prediction I picked as well back in the day. And and while Lineker is closer to a shot at the title, Dodson steals all of that with a successful victory here. He steals all his momentum and gets, uh, you know, picks up a big victory. Both guys, five foot three. Two-inch reach advantage for Lineker. He is also six years younger than uh, Dodson. Now, each one of these individuals is a legit knockout threat. 13 knockouts by John Lineker. Nine for John Dodson. Neither man has been knocked out, so they have pretty solid chins on both sides. At least the numbers would indicate that. Uh, other numbers worth mentioning before we talk about their striking abilities. Lineker, 10-4 and four in fights ended by decision. So he's capable of going the distance and winning a matchup. We saw that against Rob Font. For Dodson, 7-7 seven and seven in the same scenario. So his numbers aren't quite as... In- he has two losses against Demetrius Johnson. So keep that in mind. The only two, the only guy to beat him in the UFC. But still 7-7. Seven and seven. Lineker has four submission wins and three submission losses. Dodson's never been submitted. He does have two submission wins on his record. I don't think submissions will play a role unless we get a knockdown. And in most situations, that'll be, that would be... In- if Lineker knocked him down, he might go for a submission. But it's probably not going to be decided there. Now, these two men, despite their massive knockout numbers, deploy their power in vastly different ways. Uh, They are equally as dangerous, but again, vastly different ways of knocking their opponent the fuck out. Lineker has huge thumping power. Step into the clinch or into the pocket and let it fly. In addition to that, he has an awesome chin, which he has 100% confidence in. Both Mayday McDonald and uh, Francisco Rivera cracked him with some massive shots. And those are big hitters right there. They hit him with some big shots, and he just kept coming forward. He ate it for lunch, num, 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 and then just kept firing. He is more technical, though, than people give him credit for. He throws a lot of wide hooks, he hammers his opponents with leg kicks, and he goes to the body viciously with those hooks as well, and that starts to hurt his opponent. Because of his lower stature, he's right there to rip to the body, and then he will come upstairs once they start to cover up, and it's a very effective way of mixing up his offense. It also serves to slow his opponent down, and again, as I said, it sets up those headshots. He has a big overhand right, which he'll mix in. He'll throw both an overhand right or that right hook. He'll launch a leaping left hook as well. Look for him to throw a counter right hook to the body, and he covers distance very well. It's deceptive, because he tends to plot at times, but then, boom, he's right in your face, landing those big shots. When he knocked out Michael McDonald, he cracked him with a right hook early with a flurry. He landed a couple uppercuts. They threw some shots along the cage. It became absolute mayhem, and eventually he landed a right hand that, that flatline McDonald and put him out for good in a matchup that a lot of people were looking forward to and it did not disappoint now but the thing was Lineker he didn't throw a lot of t- a ton of offense early on he you know he then he launched into it all of a sudden and boom away he goes it's it just he was being very patient looking for his opportunity and he did have a moment early in that fight where Lineker or McDonald took the initiative and jumped in and Lineker kind of rolled his head back and just looked to slip and rip and catch them time them as they come in and land one of those big shots and that can be equally as effective now for Dodson what makes him so effective is he is exceptionally quick and with that speed and quickness he brings big time stopping power that speed makes him both hard to defend against and difficult to attack he is. It was a, a quick right jab, a lot of hard low kicks. We saw him drop Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson on multiple times in their first meeting. Uh, when he took it, Manny, Manny Gambier, and he caught him with a series of short right hands and eventually put him down, which, again, Manny's a guy who's fought at heavier weight classes, and Dodson or, didn't hit him with a whole heck of a lot to eventually put him away. So, you know, that shows the kind of power that uh, the magician packs. Um, one of the things, though, with 
uh, Dodson is he's, he had a knee injury, and that was something worth questioning. Has he lost some speed? He fought Zach Makovsky before Demetrius Johnson. When he fought Demetrius Johnson, second time he didn't fare nearly as well against Johnson. That could be because Johnson's getting better. That could be because Johnson realized some of the things he did didn't do as well in the first fight and improved upon them. But it could also be because of this, this knee injury. And you go back to the Makovsky fight, and Zach Makovsky landed some big strikes. He had a lot of success timing and landing some shots against Dodson, actually initiating some of the attacks and catching them. And one of the things he was landing with, you know, routinely was a very clean left hand. Dodson tends to hold his right hand very low when he comes in. He keeps it down by his chest instead of up by his chin. And that opens him up to a left hand that his opponent can crack him with. And Mikovsky landed over and over and over again. And the other thing Mikovsky was doing was mixing up his offense to keep him thinking. He was throwing a bunch of different techniques, forcing him to react. And at times, Dodson looked cautious because he was getting tagged a couple of times. And that's something you have to keep in mind in a fight like this, that if Dodson tastes Lineker's power once... Does that change the the complexion of this matchup? Lineker brings a ton of power and a ton of pressure. And his ability to both attack the body and the head is going to create that deviation of attack where Dodson's like, where's where he going next? Where's he going next? And he starts struggling to pull the trigger, and it opens up opportunities. Plus, we've also seen Lineker fake takedowns and then throw punches. And while Dodson's got exceptional takedown defense, if he's forced to react, that's going to open him up. When you look at Dodson's numbers, even though it's 7-5 and five in decisions, excluding the two Mighty Mouse decisions, his style doesn't equate well to decisions. You know, he tends to point fight and look for knockouts. Lineker's chin is unreal, so it's going to be very difficult for Dodson to stop him. We've seen him take bigger shots from bigger hitters and not go down. Can Lineker keep that pace and keep Dodson, you know, keep landing and keep pressuring Dodson over the prolonged fight? I think he can. Over five rounds, I think he can. 37 strikes landed by Zach Makovsky, 79 by Elliott in decisions. Dodson, you know, not including the DJ decisions, Dodson can, can be hit in fights, and all of Dodson's best performances have come in knockouts. When he can't knock his opponent out, the fights are much closer, and he's not nearly as dominant. People say, oh, you know, Elliott... Uh, Tim Elliott gave him a run. Zach Mikoski fought a great fight against him. And those are the type of fights where if Lineker has a great fight and Lineker is able to hit him with you know high frequency, that's a different story altogether. I think Lineker is going to cut off the cage. And the other big question, so we're talking about the cage, is are we using a smaller cage for this fight night, which tends to be the case. And if that's the case, that benefits the Brazilian significantly because he's going to not have to travel nearly as much distance to close that distance and land strikes. I think he's going to cut in. He's going to land with big shots. Keep Dodson guessing, keep him reacting, keep him in a position where he's not comfortable with. Look for Lineker to both counter as Dodson moves in and press forward to land that big left hand, rip some shots to the body, have Dodson off the cage and fighting and hesitating and guessing. And I know Greg Jackson is going to have John Dodson ready for this matchup. He's going to come up with a great strategy. But once you get in the cage, it's fighter versus fighter. And I think Lineker is going to catch him with the left hand. He's going to hurt him. He's going to take away some of that speed. He's going to make him second guess himself. He's going to close in and eventually he's going to land. And my prediction is John Lineker to defeat John Dodson by knockout. So those are my four main card predictions for UFC Fight Night 96. All of my preliminary predictions, as always, can be found at KamikazeOverdrive.net. I'm looking forward to Dodson, Johnson, uh, Dodson versus Lineker very much. It's going to be a fantastic fight, and a lot of people talk about, well, this is a tune-up fight kind of for a possible matchup with Dominic Cruz because of the uh, the elusiveness and the footwork of Dodson. Certainly it's not anything like Dominic Cruz, but certainly it's a step in that direction. We'll see how John Lineker fares, but I really like some of the things I've seen, some of the things I've been able to anticipate uh you know come up with in this matchup so again if you want to buy the bet packs i'm certainly looking to i'll put the work in again we'll hopefully turn it around uh, you know I've, uh, my success isn't all dictated by uh bet pack or by the parlays you certainly there's a lot of information i've heard a lot of people say they don't even bother with the parlays they look at all the other breakdowns all the other information i provide and that's what they go with and then you do their own thing and that's certainly something up to you either way thanks for tuning in guys it's been a blast we got lots more fights ahead of us as 2016 gears up for the end if you will uh, talk to you all soon. Bye-bye.